Welcome everyone to another episode of Inside Line Podcast with your host, Dr. Daniel Cameron. In this episode, Dr. Cameron will be discussing the diagnostic value of a lumbar puncture in Lyme neuroborreliosis. Good evening, Dr. Cameron. Good evening, Darlene. Happy to be with you. Now, th- this was uh, this was interesting. The authors uh, wrote about uh, the case of a 61-year-old woman, um, but they also brought up the the challenges or the controversy regarding ordering a lumbar puncture for diagnostic purposes. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the background of the case? Yeah, it seemed like this story was pretty straightforward because there is a what the woman thought was a spider bite initially. And with a spider bite, you know, they, they treated with the cephalexin, which in America they call it keflex. So they initially assume that cellulitis. Now, even that's interesting because there are a lot of Lyme rashes that in hindsight were called cellulitis. Cellulitis just means infection of the skin. So she not only had that rash, she went on to have a more of a raised circular rash. Then she went on and, and also had uh, uh, some, a variety of other symptoms like neck pain, arm pain, and weakness. In fact, she was so weak, she had troubles uh, combing her hair. So at that particular point, when you have the rash, you have progressive symptoms, uh, then you're still uh, you know, not completely sure uh, what's uh, going on, but when she finally developed Bell's palsy, which is a paralysis of a part of her face, facial muscles, then it was clear that it was Lyme disease. And the last piece of information was, there's a Western blot IgM, which is indicative of early Lyme. And so when you put all that together, it looks like a straightforward case of, uh, of Lyme disease. Now the cephalexin, is used for various skin infections, but does not work for Lyme. Now, if she didn't develop Bell's palsy, which is the paralysis of the facial muscle, it might have been hard to uh, make the diagnosis. They might have gone in another direction. They might have gone in a uh, neurologic diagnosis. They, they also happen to have a positive Lyme test uh, called the IgM Western blot test. That's a test that's positive in early Lyme. So when you put the rash together, and you put together the, 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 all of the symptoms, uh, it looked like Lyme disease, sound like Lyme disease. Uh, and uh, the uh, doctor came along and says, well, let's do a spinal tap to confirm the diagnosis. But now the patient uh, refused to, to have that, that procedure and, and wh- why would that be the case? Well, she, uh, according to author, politely declined because she asked the right question. If the treatment decision would be altered by the spinal tap. Uh, and so they uh, came to the conclusion that they were still gonna do the intravenous ceftriaxone anyway. And they weren't uh, convinced that a spinal tap was actually gonna be helpful. So instead they, they went ahead and treated for Lyme disease with intravenous after consulting with neurology and infectious disease. They officially called it early disseminated Lyme neuroborreliosis, manifesting as radicular neuritis, motor weakness, and facial nerve palsy. So let me break that down. Radicular neuritis means it's running down the nerve. The nerve's inflamed. There's also weakness called motor weakness and the facial nerve palsy. So that combination of radicular pain, weakness, and Bell's palsy, in Europe, they call it Bandworth syndrome, B-A-N-N-W-A-R-T-H syndrome. Uh, we we uh, don't look for it that often in America because Europeans said they have it and we don't have it and during some of the earlier research. What often happens in medicine is that you still find more and more uh, uh, findings. And in uh, and this case, uh, you added the Banworth look and everything else, it was time to get treated. Yeah, they had uh, two indications that it was early. 
uh, they call it early disseminated Lyme disease. They also had Bell's palsy, which certainly gets your attention. And so immediately uh, they decided to uh, go ahead with four weeks of doxycycline. So even though I mentioned earlier, the doctors will often do intravenous rocephin or ceftriaxone is that they've shown in studies that if you catch Lyme disease early, like at the time of the Bell's palsy, it's kind of a close one that the oral doxycycline and intravenous uh, ceftriaxone both work. And given that option is that uh, I would prefer oral antibiotics if I, if I could. In this case, uh, she was effectively treated. Incidentally, uh, because she had Bell's palsy, which uh, often is referred to in the literature as seventh nerve palsy, because of that, they gave prednisone 60 milligrams a day for five days and eye drops. Um, there's always a debate, should you do steroids in someone you know as Lyme? You know, we know we use, but we know we use steroids if somebody has uh, Bell's palsy from a virus, because it seems to help in recovery. Uh, but I wrote a blog once uh, about uh, an article where if you gave steroids, uh, some of the neurologic findings did not clear up so well. Um, I try to avoid prednisone, but you know, since I work with neurologists and infectious disease, sometimes I, I have to use uh, steroids anyway, just in case they help. And the woman's uh, symptoms improved following this treatment? Yeah, they did a two-week follow-up, and, and I always encourage follow-up, and the facial weakness and the pain cleared up, which is, uh, which is to be expected in early disease. And it was nice that you didn't need to do to take intravenous antibiotics. Um, I always do follow up because uh, occasionally I have to go longer with early Lyme or I have to do intravenous after all. But she had a great outcome, which is typical for early Lyme. Now, over time, some of the people who do really well will relapse or they'll go on and get infected again with a tick uh, born illness. And so I always tell people uh, to be careful with ticks and be careful to come back if there's problems. Now, the authors also talk a little bit about um, the spinal tap controversy and that it might not be so accurate and, and, and using it in a diagnosis. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, there are some people who recommend a spinal tap analysis in these situations, uh, uh, especially if they think it's acute meningitis. But the other decision is to go ahead and treat. So given doctors are divided, on how to approach, I thought I'd mention a little more about what we find in a spinal tap. Uh, there was an article uh, that I often refer to from 1990, where they looked at people, actually 27 people who had neurologic Lyme disease. And in that study, even though they had neurologic Lyme disease, only two had an abnormal spinal tap. And one of those, to uh, had what they call pleocytosis. That means they, they had cells in their um, spinal fluid, but they only had seven cells, so it wasn't very impressive. And the other one had a, uh, an antibody level that was the same as in the blood, and that's called, the, that, that's called a ratio. And so neither one were very impressive. Most important finding of that is that 25 out of 27 had nothing that they could document in a spinal tap. So for years, I've been reluctant to uh, do a spinal tap unless there's some other disease or some other illness. You know, if we suspect a bleed, I need to look for red blood cells. If the neck is uh, quite rigid or if there's uncertainty, then I'll, I'll have to do a spinal tap. But in an acute setting, like in this case, with the Bell's palsy, with the Banworth syndrome, and uh, a uh, rash, it, uh, it seemed reasonable to go ahead with uh, a uh, treatment. Now, last thing I wanna mention is that, that they have been coming up with um, some proposals for new tests. So there's, a, there's something called a chemokine biomarker, 
that's called CXCL13. And so they're hoping they can come up with a better test to look for Lyme, but uh, I'm not convinced that's uh, gonna be that helpful. They've other, also done studies saying, well, what is the ratio? That is, what's the ratio so we can be sure that the antibodies in a brain are not from the bloodstream? So they call it 1.3. That means they have to have 30% more antibodies in a spinal fluid than in the uh, blood. So that's why when you see a spinal tap, you'll often say, oh, let's get a blood test at the same time as a spinal. And if the, if the spinal tap is higher than the blood by 30%, then that's considered diagnostic. It's just hardly anybody has that number in, uh, in some studies. There was, interesting enough, a study where everybody had an abnormal spinal tap, but in that study, you couldn't be in the study unless you had an abnormal spinal tap. So they were just saying, um, can you prove to us that there's neurologic findings from Lyme disease? And I think uh, they confirmed it. It's just in an actual practice, the spinal tap is, is not uh, all that useful. So what, what do you think the, the strong takeaway is from this case report? I think the authors at the end summed it up pretty well that they said that the spinal tap may be important to rule it out uh, to rule out other diagnoses, and I, I like the word may. Uh, it's they stress that a spinal tap is uh, can be done, but any diagnosis of Lyme neuroborreliosis or neurologic Lyme is a clinical decision that has to take into account all the clinical problems. And they mentioned that you could potentially spare someone from a spinal tap if you have a. Uh, the right clinical indication. And uh, I often find that that I, I don't have enough reason to do a spinal tap. Uh, there's a lot of neurologists I refer my patients to where they might have done a spinal tap if it's brand new, fresh in an ER, but they're certainly reluctant to do it if you've already been sick a few weeks and you're coming into the office and, uh, and you're going to the neurologist's office and uh, the yield, of uh, doing a spinal tap is pretty low. So I support the authors is that just don't automatically do a spinal tap and make a, de a clinical decision. Well, thank you for speaking to us and uh, talking a little bit about, about this case study. And for um, our viewers, they can read more about the study as well on your blog at danielcameronmd.com. So thank you again, Dr. Cameron. And thank you, Darlene.